Welcome to Not Your Mother's Radio Presents Fly on the Wall Podcasts. Today, we will be talking crap, with Grammy Award-winning record producer and songwriter, Charlie Midnight. Charlie will be discussing his new book, Deserves Got Nothing to Do With It. He will be explaining the five elements that will help you survive your emotional journey to success. Charlie and Elliot will also be discussing Charlie's involvement with Dan Hartman, Stevie Ray Vaughan, James Brown, Joni Mitchell, and others. So, let's join the conversation. That's right, so uh, it's, it's been too long. Yeah, it's been a long time. Not that long, but it's great to see you. Uh, you know, you're looking good. Yeah, feeling good. Um, how about you? You doing okay? Yeah, you know, the same as it ever was, as the song goes, you know, just staying busy and, uh, you know, staying safe and, um, you know, looking at the outside world, you know, the, how everything is going crazy and, um, yeah. you know, yep. it's nuts. So um, we're all set to go. But I, before we get started, though, um, sure. I want to tell you how brilliant your new um, single is. Oh, thank you. I must, I must have listened to it a dozen times since last night and um, very, very uh, um, film noir, noir-y feel to it. It is, it is, it is, it is. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, I appreciate that. You know, um, I, we've been writing this album with Mark, I don't know, Mark Swirsky, who's uh -huh. my great, great friend and collaborator on so many things, who introduced me to my wife and was the last bass player in the whatever the last incarnation of the Charlie Midnight Band was. And, you know, we stayed friends and we just write, you know, my album, when I came out, I was so disappointed by it. And um, not that it wasn't successful, but that it wasn't really what I had been doing. Um, and I really, I was proud of the picture on my album cover, but other than that, really not proud of anything else on the album and um and so mark down through the you know mark and i just decided you know hey give me some chords let's do some jamming and then uh, there was a certain point uh where we just be right before the pandemic where we got all our friends into the studio and uh the cheapest album ever made because we were just jamming and i you know told everybody look, you know, Mark's playing the chords, do your thing, I'll do some lyrics and let's have a good time. So everything, everything came out very spontaneously. And so finally Mark said, you know, why don't we put the album out? Everybody else is doing it. <laughs> and Perfect. that was that, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, so. So um, for everybody out there, once we get this up and running, um, sure. I'm going to be talking crap today with Charlie Midnight. Okay, and we're, I love and, that. And we're going to be explaining what that means. Charlie's going okay. to take it. But um, I also read the um, uh, the sample of the book. And um, your background was pretty much, um, mine was similar to yours. Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I was born in Brooklyn. Um, I, I wound up going to high school in Queens, the tough school. Springfield, which, which school? Springfield Gardens. Which school? Springfield Gardens, right, right. right off of the yeah. belt, right, yeah. right off the belt. Actually, Parkway. we used to go from Bensonhurst. We used to go up to Corona, uh -huh. and and where where we would like pick fights with uh -huh. the people up in Corona. That's what you know. So it's like Queens was the enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I was basically. I was young there, and um, so I got fights picked against me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I sorry know. if it would. You're younger than I am. So yeah. so you're yeah. younger than I am, so it probably wasn't me. I'm telling no, well, you. It wasn't you. We come from the same tribe. It was different tribes yeah, yeah. that got to me. It was, yeah. um, you know, it was, um, you know, in those days, it, it was insanity. But um, you know, the school that I went to had, before I left had um, a metal detectors. You know, yeah. you needed metal yeah. detectors to get in and out of school. Yeah. And then, I, then we finally moved to uh, Long Island and... Um, it, it wasn't easier there, only the, the enemy was just a diff different, um, just a different skin tone, you know, it was just the same, same crap every school you went to. But what, um, what, what, where, on, where on the island? Where on Long Island? Uh, I grew up in Belmore, South Belmore. Yeah, Belmore, yeah, sure. I, I'm, of course, I'm familiar with 
the yeah. island. And well, 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 the well, my sister lived in um, Trump, um, in the building that your brother lived in, in Trump Apartments, right, yep. out, of, right out of Coney yep. Island. Coney yep. Island. Yep, the right. worst. Uh -huh. I don't know what your sister's experience was, but yeah. my brothers, they were, ter it was a terrible place to live. Yeah, well, um, yeah, she's been out of there for a while. And um, yeah, so we kind of came from the same breeding ground. So um, it's interesting because everybody from that, you know, from the same breeding ground that that reads this book said, wow, you know what I mean? I recognize all that stuff. So yeah. I, I've just, it's very gratifying to me. Now, you know, you, you know, Artie Kornfeld, right? I, well, I, I know Artie, though. I know yes. who he is. And okay, I, well, think, I think I met him up at uh, uh, once up at Michael Lang's place up yes. in, um, Woodstock. In, in Woodstock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, Artie was, came from Bensonhurst, too. And he wrote a song called Bensonhurst Blues, which uh, you ought to check it out. It's all over YouTube. You may get yeah. a kick out of it. He, uh, he's very proud of that too. It's one of the songs that he wrote. And um, he also wrote um, uh, uh, um, Pied Piper. Remember the song, the Pied Piper? Sure, of course. Yeah, the okay. Lemon, the, who, who sang that? Crispin St. Peter's. Had the Crispin St. Peter's, yes. And, yeah. and, and he also did the Rain the Park and other things for the Cowsills. And, oh, that's uh, yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And the uh, Dead Man's Curve. Man ah, now that that's a great song, Dead yeah. Man's Curve. He wrote you that know. with he wrote that with Jan and Brian Wilson. That's so, a great song. Yeah, that's a great song. Yeah. But yeah. hey, you're no slouch either. Uh, you're um, you you have a couple of hits under your belt. I, you know. I, look, I've been pretty uh, God Almighty. You know, I've been really fortunate, and uh, you know, trying to keep to. Uh, what I think I do great, not trying to follow trends, and you know, and uh, you know, my book is a lot about that, um, you know, and yeah, no, I'm, I, I, no, I have no complaints, Elliot. Good. Believe me, yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Um, well, let's get to let's get into some of the nuts and bolts of what we want to talk about today. Um, you have a new book coming out. I do. I have a new book coming out, and it's called "Deserves Got Nothing to Do with It." Right. Talking Crap with Charlie Midnight and uh, the five, five elements that will help you survive your emotional journey to success. And the five elements, this CRAP is an acronym, C-R-A-P-P, -P, for the, those five elements, which are collaboration, relationships, ambition, passion, and persistence. And, uh, you know, I formulated that. Um, well, first of all, I tried to find the right words to fit that acronym because I really like the acronym. So <laughs> luckily, I found luckily I found the five words that I think fit into that. But you know, the book the book really grew out of um, the lectures that I was giving, and especially one at NYU, uh, the Clive Davis Institute, where I gave a lecture, and afterwards uh, the kids would come up and they would say, "You know, you should really write a book." And then when I had a lunch with the head of the school at the time, and I told him the idea of CRAPP, he loved it. Okay. And so I decided to go, go from there. And it's been, you know, I don't know. I love doing it. I loved writing the book. Now, how did you get involved in the lecture circuit? Um, you know, from friends. Uh, you know, uh, my daughter was going to NYU. Uh, as a film major uh, and, a, and, a, and a screenwriting major, which I have to say, she graduated as an honors scholar. So I have to brag about that a little bit, well. won some awards. But, um, you know, and then they got to know me at the school and I was asked uh, to do a lecture at the Clive Davis School by uh, uh, Jeff, who was the head of the school at the time. And, um, that got me into it. And then I did one out here at Syracuse uh, Extension because uh, uh, I had a good friend of mine who, you know, Bruce Perlmutter, who's now, you know, who's, I mean, he's, you know, he's the head of, uh, of, of I think, the, the, the digital division at the Condé Nast. And, uh, but, he, but he was out here at the time and he was, he did, had a, for the love of it, because he's a Syracuse alumnus, um, he, asked me to come and give a lecture to his class. So I started doing that and I loved it. 
I absolutely mm -hmm. loved, 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 loved it because, you know, you know, everything I talk about is anecdotal. I don't try to preach. I just say, look, I went through this. I went through this. And of course, they find it fascinating, even though some of them might not know uh, all of the artists I've worked with. You know, I can usually hit the mark with uh, James Brown, uh, Hilary Duff, um, you know. But then, of course, what's interesting is um, uh, uh, what's really interesting to me is uh, the jo Joni Mitchell also hits the mark. Because yeah. she's been so she's been so influential with with young, especially young female songwriters and artists, and you can hear her influence everywhere. That for some reason that really hits the mark. And of course, you know the other people, you know, uh, I've written for Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, and you know, Barbara, Joe Cocker, Barbara, Cor Barbara Streisand. Bob, Bob, Bob. I'll tell you one thing. Barbara is iconic through every single age. Yeah. Every single age, Barbara. I mean, the love even of younger people that they have for Barbara Streisand, you know, really speaks to her ability to communicate. Right. You know, and so Barbara, of course, has a you know, uh, you know, easy. But you know, so I give these lectures, and uh, they're fascinated, and everybody is interested in in finding out how they might be able to carve a career for themselves because that's why they're going to school. Uh, some of them are, are, are film majors majoring in, uh, in scoring and music and I've written for over 40 films. So I can give them a clue on what, what it takes to be in that field. And I just enjoy the communication. It's like a conversation to me. And since I like to talk a lot, you know, it all comes together. Well, it, it, well let's, the books, what I read of the book just kind of draws you in and you want to get more of it real quick. But uh, can you tell us about Bella? Uh, and my mother. <laughs> well, I talk in the book about how really how influential my mother was on forming um, who I was and my philosophy about, you know, don't complain, just get on with it. Um, and, 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 I had one friend of mine, because my mother is really tough. Uh -huh. She came from that old school. And yeah. maybe, I don't know uh, how your mother was, but uh, there was a tough. certain, it was a certain mother from those days that went through a hard scrabble life, right? right and they right. were really tough. And my mother never talked about whether life was good, whether life was bad. For her, life just was. And you woke up in the morning and you got on with it. And so uh, I had a friend of mine <laughs> who started calling her Bella the Barracuda because, <laughs> you know, because she would say, you know, she would say things, I mean, that would, people would be, what are you talking about? Joe? What are you afraid of? You got shit in your pants? I mean, you know, it's, it's you know, and it comes from a certain day and age, but, it, but they called her that lovingly. Right. You know what I mean? It was because they all appreciated how tough she was. You know, and I have stories about, I had one story about my mother. I'm not, I don't even remember if I have it in the book, but it's a great, because it's a great story about how she saw, saw two guys beating up on another guy and, she, and this little, you know, five foot, four inch, you know, gray haired Jewish woman went in the middle and said, you guys should be ashamed of yourselves. Yeah. Ganging yeah. up on this one guy and, yeah. and they, and they stopped. So. So she was completely influential in, in, in my life. And it was, but, but really, you know, no matter how tough she was, there was unconditional love, right. which, which I found out because, you know, my father lost his job. My mother had to go to work. We grew up in a neighborhood in a, in a, in, of, of, uh, of laborers, of factory workers, you know, and, and, uh, and my father lost his job. And cause he came home one day and he said to my mother, uh, Bill, I, I hate, uh, my father's name was Leo. And he, he said, you know, Bill, I can't stand my job. You know, and my mother said, quit. You don't like it, quit. Right? And so he quit. And my mother had to go to work. And, and my father eventually got another job and it taught me. And that was part of, of, of the lesson that I learned is that if you really hate what you're doing and you believe in yourself, uh, you know, you shouldn't be doing it. Find something else to do. And I know that's in, in where, we, where we grew up, and especially in America, for certain people, 
Um, that is a possibility. It's not a possibility for everybody. I understand that, that we're very privileged. Even though I grew up in a lower class neighborhood where the richest guy on my block owned a taxi, uh, the second richest was a waiter in a, in a restaurant, a fancy restaurant in Manhattan. Um, you know, you, you know, we were still, especially growing up so close to Manhattan, you know, we were privileged. We knew we had opportunities if we could work our asses off. And I understand that never, not everybody has that. So it sort of becomes, I learned that it's also a responsibility. If you have the privilege of opportunity, then you should use that privilege. You know, I- Were your yeah. parents born in America? Both of my parents, they were first generation. Both of their parents, uh, my mother's family came from Austria. And uh, and they got out, you know, uh, be, be before all the, before the, uh, the yeah. Nazis moved in, and um, and my father's family came from uh, Russia, Polish uh, uh-huh. area, where Russia at that time sort of was, you know, right. they were ruling Poland. You know, we, we're flipped. My father's folks came from um, Germany, Austria, and my mother's family were the Russian, Polish. Yeah, yeah. By, 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 by the way, it's interesting because I've never taken a, a genetic uh, DNA test, but my brother did. Yeah. And, and of course, I'm 98% Eastern European. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no, uh, you know, except I am 0.01% Finnish. Really? Now, I don't, I don't know how that got into it, but my wife is Finnish. Oh, so, wow. yes, so fully Finnish. She born well, there you go. So that, was, that was the attraction. <laughs> That's it, you know. There's a finit. There's my there's my kindred spirit, you know. So, uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, no. Bella had an incredible. I mean, there are stories in the book that, about her uh, that are true. I mean, my recollections uh, are. I mean, they're slightly hazy, but the the essence of them are true, and the actual incidents really happened. Of course, I might have tried to color things a little bit, sure. you know, being being a writer, but. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, Bella was, and my father was also because he was known as uh, the man with the most integrity. Uh, he never got a speeding ticket in his life, and he 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 was uh, he, he had to work in a in also a very tough environment. He became uh, when he was older after working in a factory for so many years. They gave him uh, a job as a union representative um, because as sort of uh, well, you've been part of the union since you're a kid. Uh, this will be better for you, Leo. You'll have a make a lot more money, and that was rough. Being a liaison between workers and bosses, yeah, that's that that's that that is rough. And really, I think he enjoyed working in the factory more. Yeah, I yeah. I, I was involved with unions too. I used to manage. Um, I was part of the management crew at the Meadowlands, yeah. and um, we had you know I I was management, but we. My staff was union, and that that in between the guy was tough, you know. The guy, you know, it was a fine line. He used to say to me, um, "Look, every four or five weeks, I'm going to pull you outside. I'm going to rip your ass apart, and then we're going out for dinner." He said, "I have to do this. That's what they pay me for." Right, right. But it was a fine line. He didn't want to piss me off, and he didn't want to piss off his that's you know, exactly, union people. That's that's exactly right because. You know, it was the paper box cutters industry with cardboard boxes, you know, on 7th Avenue, they sure. have all of those, you know, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't the Teamsters. It was a, a, a fragile industry. Now, of course, it's cardboard boxes are through the roof because everybody decided plastic is not good for the environment, you know, but back then it was, you know, bosses that have been in the same uh, industry forever. Uh, and then workers who always thought they were being underpaid, uh, which they were basically. And my father had a balance also used delicate balance between, you know, representing the workers and not pissing the bosses up who had all the off, who had all the power. So, but it was, you know, it was a good gig that gave him a better pension, you know, when, when good. he retired. So it was good in that sense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so you came from um, a working class environment. Um, my, my, you know, uh, we've all 
you know, we kind of had the same, same thing going. Now you decided to um, leave school and you went to Europe and you would try your hand at music, which it may not have worked out at first, but you definitely made it work for you. Well, it did, it did work. Uh, I had, look, I was uh, started when I was in school singing in rock and roll bands and, you know, at these dives in Brooklyn, uh, it wasn't, none of it was original material. You know, you'd be singing, you know, Mustang Sally, you know, and, and all those songs. Uh, and um, Those songs you know, are still being used today, though. Uh, it, well, you know, if you watch commercials, the majority of songs are older songs. And casting no aspersions on the modern songs, but it's because they had indelible hooks. Mm -hmm. you know that were instantly recognizable and you know it was a certain type of songwriting which you know that's the age that i came from but you know i decided i was going to college as an english major and you know i really wasn't interested in in school i'd never been really interested in school but i was going because that's what you do and i started singing with this band and one of the members was uh british and so we decided to take off to london you know, when nothing much ever happened, but it was really a great experience. And, uh, you know, and it, it, it tested me uh, and I got home and, you know, I decided that's really what I wanted to do regardless. Right. And um, yeah, so, you know, but once again, going back to the lessons I learned, uh, you know, I always worked a part-time job while rehearsing bands. Uh, you know, never, well, my family didn't have any money, but certainly I could have always gone home and being taken, being take, be taken care of by my family. Uh, but, you know, learn that lesson, you know, look, you got to work for it to do it and keep at it. And, and uh, I had to really develop, which I talk about in my book, the philosophy of, of um, you know, the creativity has to be an end in and of itself also to, to survive emotionally. Because if you don't, get, you know, if you don't get that juice out of when you wrote a song or we had a good rehearsal or we did a good gig, and that makes you feel good enough to say, okay, I'm going to carry on, then you're never going to last, right. you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, and really that has to do a lot with the title of my book, which is Deserves Got Nothing to Do With It, uh, because what I, what I really find um, uh, jarring to me is when, people say if it's meant to be it's meant to be well that gives you an excuse to fail but it gives you an excuse that if you become successful well i was meant to be successful so that's who i am and we know that there are so many factors that have to converge in order to create any type of success that that's a it's a it's a false to me that's a a, a false saying if it's meant to be it's meant to be and deserves got nothing to do with it and I'm, I'm sure you read this uh, in my book, and I love to tell this story, uh, came from uh, one of my favorite movies, um, uh, Unforgiven, with Clint, Clint Eastwood and Gene, Morgan, Morgan, Freeman. Morgan Freeman and Gene Hackman. Right? Mm -hmm. It's one of my favorite movies. And I could watch the ending over and over, where uh, you know Clint is a gunfighter, Morgan Freeman is his buddy, and they're going to... For, for a job in this town and, uh, and, and they do the job and they're supposed to, they, they leave, but the posse catches Morgan Freeman and they take him back to the town. And little Bill, who is Gene Hackman Gene and Hackman. the sheriff is a real tough guy and he whips Morgan Freeman to death. Yeah. And then they put him in a coffin outside the bar and there comes in the pouring rain, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood, um, uh, it, and he comes in and he sees his friend outside the bar, his dead body in a coffin. And he comes in and, with the thunder going and, and with a rifle in his hand. And, uh, and that's it. And he kills everybody, of course. And then he uh, sees, a, and then he's got little Bill lying on the floor. And uh, he has that, his rifle, his shotgun, his rifle pointed at little Bill's head, ready to blow him away. And little Bill goes, Deserves got nothing to do with this. I was building a house. Yeah. Clint looks down and goes, Deserves got nothing to do with it. And he blows him away. Yeah. And really, it's my burst of deserves got nothing to do with it. So if you want it, go out there and and keep at it. Yeah. So um 
deserves has nothing to do with it. So what do you tell people when they kind of come to you and say, I do deserve more than more, more results than I'm getting? You know, I, I say this, this, there's no formula. I mean, you have to believe in yourself. And the worst thing I think for any artist, and this is part of what I tell them when I mentor young artists, you should never say why them and not me, which is basically what you're talking about, right? right. And I say, cause you'll never figure it out. I mean, right. and once you're a success, you can work backwards and mm -hmm. figure out the points that led them to this, just like I can do it myself and figure out the points to it. But I had no idea as I was going along. So it really becomes, um, for me, more, more about like what I write about in the book. How do you survive emotionally until you get to where you want to go? And really what it distills down to is if I can do it, you can do it. But you have to have these elements and you have to have the determination. You have to have the passion. I mean, almost everybody I know who start and it's, it's a long time, you know, since I began, who started out in the New York scene with me, uh, manage it today to have some kind of career in music. It's amazing. The ones that really had that passion and, and the talent, because the one mistake that a lot of people make is wanting to be something because they think it's cool as opposed, as opposed to what I could, what I'm great at, what I'm great at. Do you, tell, do you, do you yeah. tell people right out that you may not have the talent to do this? No, because I've worked, you know, I, I don't think so. Basically, everybody has some kind of talent. Uh, and, and when it comes to the music field, it's so diverse on what might make you successful. If you could find that out. Um, but what I, what I do say, if you really want to do this, bring it to me, you know, and I could be honest with you about what I think your strengths are. You know, like I always say, I can't tell you how to write a song, but if you bring me your song, I can, um, I believe that I can tell you how to make it better or what's great about it. And also to follow your own unique talent in songwriting. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, no, I, uh, I would never tell somebody because I've seen examples of people who I don't think are very talented in the music area and yet they become successful because they found a way or they found something that, that that is special about what they do or what they are, you know, and, and they figured out how to put that out there. Because, you know, the entertainment business is, you know, it's, it's the Wild West, basically. You, you, you don't know. So I would never tell somebody that. But if you want to work with me or if you want me to mentor you, I will be very strong about what I think you should do. Right. You know, and, and you can disagree with me. That's fine. And we can fight about it. But if you come to me, I'm going to give you my opinion, you know, or else don't come to me. It's just like as a producer, I'm a certain type of record producer. And I say, you know, if you want what I do, I think I'm great at it, but I might not be the type of record producer you want. So you should go to, if you want somebody that, that can sit at the board and, you know, twist all the dials and, and, uh, and uh, you know, and, and just be sort of a supplement to you because you think you're the producer, that's not the type of producer I can be. Okay. Now, just to get off the track for one second. Sure. How does it feel having somebody like Joni Mitchell cover one of your tunes? It's, it's, I, I can't even imagine. That is, uh -huh, one of the uh -huh. big, that, that's one of the biggest questions I get when I. I mean, she's brilliant. She's uh, a brilliant she's, writer. I, not only a brilliant writer, but she's a hardcore artist. Yeah. Who develop, you cannot teach somebody to write like. Joni Mitchell. Right. She's inspired. She's an original melodist. Her melodies are like nobody else's melodies. And it's sort of sort of pop at its jazz, you know, in, a, in, a, in its approach to the way melodies go and the way she writes lyrics. Right. I, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, one thing she has contributed, her lyrics often are very biographical. Right. And, and that has really contributed to the landscape today. You know right. of how people write songs, and she um, did a she did a brilliant job on your tune. You know, how, do you, how, how do you stop? I mean, right. I thought 
that would, that happened to be my favorite cut on the uh, Gravity James Brown album. James Brown, yeah, yeah. And I love that tune. It kind of grabbed me, you know, almost forty years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it was nineteen. Uh, the James Brown record came out eighty five or eighty six. Yeah, so we're you yeah. know forty five yeah, years. We're, we're getting there. Thirty five years, years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah thirty five yeah. years ago. And um, I remember because um, my son is thirty seven, and when he was an infant, that was the first concert I took my wife to after she gave birth to him. Right. And, and my mother watched my son and um, right. Radio City, James Brown right. Radio City. I, you know, I might have been there. I'm sure you were. I remember going to his and that he sang "Living in America" a few times uh -huh. in that in that show. And I, yeah, so yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm sure I was there. Yeah. And, and by that time in his career, he was old. He was tired. Right, he was right. out of shape. He was. Um, but man, he, his voice was there, and he had a killer band. And um, he, you know, he always had it. But um, how do you stop? Was was I think was the uh, uh, pinnacle on that album. And then when I heard Joni Mitchell do it, I was I was wondering how does somebody like Joni figure out this song is for me? You know, it, I I have four thousand tunes hidden away somewhere. I want to do this one. Well, you know, that's that's and that's really an interesting question. And um, what I was and and by the way, as if you heard both versions, she certainly. Yeah. Uh, put her own chord inversions uh, as she does. And the one thing, uh, just for songwriters, Joni never asked, and she could have, because today every pop singer tries, whether you wrote the song on whatever, you write the song, they always ask for a piece of it. Their attorneys call up and they go, oh, they got to have 5% of that. Joni never asked for anything, even though she even changed a couple of lives, okay, because of her respect for being the writer, okay? But anyway, so the story I heard, which Dan Hartman told me because he was out in Los Angeles where, and this is what he told me, okay, so it's secondhand, but uh, that he, he told me that he met Joni out there, told her who he was, and she said to him, oh, you wrote that song, How Do You Stop? She said, well, I've been doing that in, in, um, in you know, I've been doing that live, and I've been working up that song because she was, she had, this is incredible, and this is why, never asked me how to get a song placed with somebody, because it's like magic almost. So anyway, so, so she was watching a Cinemax special with James Brown, called James Brown and Friends, mm -hmm. with Aretha Franklin, uh, Wilson Pickett, um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, Joe Cocker was on it, so yeah. I had two people I had worked with on it. Uh, uh, anyway, a lot of really great people. Oh, and, and uh, uh, Robert Palmer. Who, Robert Palmer, yeah. May he rest in peace, who was actually, I didn't realize what a great singer he was. Yeah. Because out of everybody there, he got on stage and he duetted with James Brown with so much soul and vigor that it was a revelation to me, you know. So, um, but anyway, so she was watching it. And what Dan told me, she said, I really like that lyric because, because nobody writes about the idea of, of getting older and what happens and, you know, which is really the, the song, what, how do you stop this about? You know, how do you deal with, with, with this, the, the, the getting older and the, 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 the changes in, in your life? And she started, she started, I guess, you know, working on it in her own way. And then it wound up, on her album and the album wound up you know getting a grammy and so so that's how you get a song covered you write a great song for one artist that has and then and then it's get covered by another artist and the first song sounds nothing like the second one but um then you get lucky enough to have Joni Mitchell yeah. be the one who records it and suddenly Joni Mitchell has covered a song of yours so, I mean, it's an incredible story, but that happens to me um, because I just, I write, I guess I write for the love of it. I mean, as crazy as it is, and I have a lot of songs I've written that I love, and then once in a while it pops up, and I don't know why it gets covered by somebody. And, um, you know, and that's, you know, that's been the story of, of my career because I'd never try, I, I have never 
been one of those songwriters who, okay, let's push songs. And, and that's a certain type of songwriter. And I appreciate that, but I don't think I would have been very good in the Brill Building, you know, because I always, because since I started out as an artist, uh, you know, I, I've always been much more of, you know, I want to say my piece instead of I want to get a song cut. So, you know, I was just very fortunate, I have to say, and this is in the, in the book that, that Dan Hartman, who I believe was one of the true geniuses in, in music, may he rest in peace. Um, uh, he heard my album and for some reason he liked it or liked the lyrics and called me up out of nowhere said, do you want to do some writing? And I really was not that familiar with, I was familiar with the Edgar Winter group, of course, sure. you know, and I wasn't familiar, so, cause I didn't pay attention to a lot of who the, who, who the bands were, the artists were uh, it, within the band, who wrote the songs. And uh, I was fortunate that um, I, 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 he called me, but I really wasn't, didn't know exactly who he was. And then um, I think it was Mark Swarsky who said to me, holy man, that's Dan Hartman. You should yeah. do some writing with him, you know? Yeah. And, and we became partners and he, I was very fortunate because he liked what I did do, uh, what I was doing as a lyricist. And, and uh, I didn't have to change what I was doing. You know, it was more the Bernie Taupin, Elton way of writing songs where I would write a lyric, give it to him, and he would, he would create something around it. Yeah. So I, I loved uh, his uh, Relight My Fire. Right. What a tune that is! Um, Amazing, and the whole I mean, vertigo, the whole vertigo thing going into it, well, brilliant. It was just brilliant. Yeah. Amazing what he did. Uh, he was, you know, he started, you know, um, uh, producing bands when he was fifteen in uh, Mechanicsville, which is near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and you know, he just was one of those geniuses that popped up, and. You know, from the get go, Edgar Winter recognized this talent. Yeah. And he was the Eric, he he was the Eric he was the um, uh, well, he was the whole Winter band. He was the focus on that band. Well, if you if you see any of the videos with him, on I saw it, him and, live with them. Yeah, I mean, playing that which I have, I have the double neck uh, guitar that he played, uh, and um, you know, if if you see any of that and you see him, it's really amazing. But and he wrote, you know, he wrote Free Ride, right. Free Ride, which which still gets, I mean, it's on commercials, it's everywhere. And he sang it. And, you know, to me, that's one of the great classics of the rock era. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, he that he was the, um, um, you know, Edgar Winter Band. He really was. He was. The well, they had, they, they had some great, I mean, Edgar Winter yeah. watched him and he played. They, 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 were, they were all great. But, but the energy that mm -hmm. Dan had was really the show winter was, was never, winter was never able to do a, put a band together like that band again oh uh, yeah well look was rick derringer i mean you know who interestingly right hang on sloopy yeah i mean you know which of course is one of those yeah. great songs from the early 60s which we all did in bands i must have sang that song 12 billion times but yeah. you know it, it's it, but it's interesting how how yes he was famous for that song but really he was a great musician yep. great great musician you know yeah. rock and roll hoochie coo too was derringer's rock and roll hoochie coo yeah. i mean yeah, yeah it's great it was, it was a truly great band and if, and if you saw them live you saw how great they were yeah they brands, were. Re, brands really knew how to put on a show and not only that for some, some reason right around that time the edgar winter band was the opening act for everybody they, yeah. they, they never had, you know, they weren't a big headlining band, but they were always on that opening act bill, and they were always, always um, gave the headliner a run for their money. Well, because they made a show better, and they also had a following, you know, when you book, as you know, when when a band is a headliner and they book other bands, a lot of it has to do with will the other band bring in, you yeah. know, uh, some audience, you know, that has a lot to do with it, but... Uh, yeah, you know, and and it's uh, it was uh, yeah, working with Dan was a revelation uh, for me. I was very fortunate, and I learned how to um, you know also write many pages of lyrics because he in, instead of him telling me what I had to change, I uh, early on I figured out well if I give him like twenty choices, he'll choose one, and I don't have to agonize. About <laughs> it, you know? That's a good so, way to do uh, it. 
but it's true, true. I thought he think he's one of the geniuses and uh, I, I know what to say. I, I owe my career to Dan Hartman. Yeah, so that, that first album, which you were a little, um, that you're a little hesitant about talking about, right. was, was your ticket, you know, it brought, it was a good connection to where you are. That, right, and that's something, that's why you can never figure it out. It's all about putting things out there. You've got to put things out there. You can't sit around and say, I'm brilliant. And why isn't anybody discovering me? Just keep creating. So I did that album. And, uh, and uh, this, this, uh, this woman that worked for the uh, label I was on, the subsidy of, of Columbia I was on, sent named Debbie, she was, her name was Debbie de Cesare, and she sent it to Dan Hartman. And uh, whoa. Who knows how these things happen? That's what I'm saying, you know? Mm. It deserves got nothing to do with it, you know? Uh, but you don't necessarily deserve it, but you can earn it. And that's like a, a big difference, you know? I deserve it. No, you know, yes, everybody deserves it, you know, but you have to earn it. Right. And that to me is really, you know, the, the crux they, of the book. What do they say? If, if, um, the luckiest people are the ones who work from day to night? Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, and 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 the ones you can't, look, we all get down. We all, you know, wonder when something's going to happen. And I was living in in real abject poverty in, uh, you know, at the border of Coney Island and um, and Brighton Beach. You know, in a place I had to nail down the windows so the junkies would. I was on the ground floor because or else they would break into the house when you weren't there. Not that I had anything to steal, but that didn't matter. You know, and to, to them, and you know, you you just learn along the way that it's. I mean, you got to keep on keeping on, and you, you know, know and, and and if it gets too painful, find something else. And those bright beach days, I guarantee, gave you a little flavor in some of your music. It added well, something like, to your experience in writing. Yeah, I mean, everything does, doesn't it? I mean, when you think about it, you know, and then you listen to, like, my new album. Now, you can probably hear um, uh, intimations of something or the other, of the influences I've had, and we all have influences. Um, and, and the, of course, the, 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 the title song of the single is, is the Blue Hotel, and it's this mystical place that, you know, people go into, and, you know, you really don't know what it is, but it's obviously, obviously something uh, that has a mystique about it, um, and, you know, and for me, uh, and we're going to come out with an album eventually uh, called the, uh, Big Night in Byzantium, and, you know, you, you, to me, it's, I guess the lesson I learned uh, and even in, you know, writing this album, and also Dan Hartman was, was, was great. He would just say, write what you write. You know, don't try to write what somebody else writes because you think we're going to have a hit. And so, you know, the music I've developed over these years with Mark Swirsky, you know, really is about that. You know, just try to write who you are. But look, I'm a, I'm a pop songwriter. So, I mean, in that sense where, you know, I want everything to have a hook. I want everything to have, you know, a good production. It's not like I want some, anything to be so esoteric that nobody's going to listen to it. Right. Okay. So right. if you filter all of your influences, whether it's Bensonhurst or, or Brighton Beach or Coney Island or, or listening to Otis Redding, which I, I don't sing like, I don't think anything in the album was influenced by him. But then there's, you know, people I loved like, Van Morrison and people like that. Or my favorite was Chuck Jackson when I was younger. Mm -hmm. um, so you filter all these things through you. You don't necessarily sound like these things, but somehow if you're honest to yourself and you let that inspiration come out, hopefully it comes out as your unique self, you know? And so, you know, hopefully this album will do that. Now we're trying to time it that it comes out uh, close to when the book is coming out, you know, so that maybe it'll gather. That's you know, soon. Yeah, yeah, no, September 3rd, the single's coming out, right. and September 7th, the book is coming out, right. and, um, you know, I have a lot of good people that uh, are, are pitching in to, 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 to try to 
you know, give it a little buzz. But really, when Mark and I decided, I mean, the book I've been working on for a bunch of years, um, and I have a, a, a my my publisher, and they're excited about it, and I'm hoping that 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 finds a place and it resonates, and I can do some more lectures uh, because the because the book has found a place. Um, but Mark and I decided we did this music. We're going to have no expectations. We're going to put it out there. Okay. Um, and of course, my experience with the last music I put out there was so bad that I always have a little trepidation thinking, well, I'm going to put out more music. And, and you know, because I had, you know, like, I, I don't even know what to say. You know, I think it's a decent album that I put out and people, some people seem to like it. I hated it. But, you know, it's really uh, dispiriting to put something out and have it just fall like dead, like a thud. But like we said earlier, it did something. It gave you a ticket to meet Dan Hartley. Yeah, I, and that, Elliot, you're so right. And so I, that's why I feel, you know, I'm, I'm so, and this is not just, you know, uh, being corny, but I'm so blessed how that happened. You know, and it had to be a series of circumstances. Debbie right. had to send it to Dan. Dan had to say, whoa, you know, I like this album. And, and which was a revelation to me because I didn't like my album. Um, but I think what he liked most about it was the lyrical approach. And he was looking for a partner because he did love the Elton and Bernie way of writing. And so he was looking for that. So I became, you know, a, yeah, I mean, what can now, I say? That was serendipity a thousand times over. Now your acronym, CRAP, does that work for um, any age? It works for any age and it works for any, um, it works for any uh, 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 job or career yeah. that you have. Yeah, any, any career it'll work. And I think I talk about that in the book because we can talk about collaboration, relationships, ambition, passion, and persistence. I mean, you can you can slot that in um, to any career that you that you have a passion about, and you and you want to get there. You want to get to some kind of success. And and you know, Confucius. I think it's Confucius that said this, but subsequently I've learned that maybe many 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 people have said this. That if you wake up in the morning, the definition of success is if you wake up in the morning and are able to go to a job you love. That's the definition of success. OK, and that to me is, you know, an, an important lesson. Like I didn't become the rock and roll star that I wanted to, although with my new album, I might very well <laughs> become that, that rock and roll star. But I mean, but but I carved out such a wonderful uh, life and career for myself, right. you know, and and, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, just got to keep at it and that door opens, go through it. Who's on the album with you? Any? Um... Well, Mark Swirsky, and sure. I had, uh, you know, there are a lot of. I mean, Mark knows all the people that I that that were on the album. Um, it, it was, you know, a lot of it was done in the studio I had at the time with a with my uh, the engineer and Joel Seifer was. I mean, he he passed away also, and we were Brooklyn buddies, you know, and. Um, he was in one of the bands I, I had and he passed away, but he was the engineer. And then we have, you know, uh, people like Buck Johnson, um, uh, who a uh, keyboard player who I'm still in touch with and I write with, and he has subsequently become the keyboard player for Aerosmith oh. and, and also the Hollywood vampires, you know, oh, and I, yeah. and one of the people that I thought was so talented, I've mentored and believed in him for so many years and kept writing. We have so many songs that we've written you know, that is somewhere on my cloud or, or, or you know, or, or on my laptop. And I don't worry about it. I love what we write. And did one record with him that, you know, was did semi all right, uh, you know, uh, and uh, produced with Mark Needham and, and, and Buck did some producing. And yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, yeah, Buck, uh, you know, he's on it. And so there are other people that are on it, uh, Denny Weston, um, a drummer who's been my friend for a lot of years. And all these people came in and they just did it. I mean, they just, there was no remuneration. 
you know, I said, let's just jam and have a good time. And uh, yeah, so it's, for me, it's a joyful album, which whatever direction it took, we let it take. Good. Well, I mean, I, I'm looking at the list of some of your associate, um, associated acts, uh, Paul Stanley, um, Christina, uh, um, uh, the Doobie Brothers, Billy Joel, Chaka Khan, uh, Cocker we discussed, Hillary Duff we discussed. Joe Cocker, yeah. I mean, it just, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And um, it's really funny. It all started from an album that you didn't like. That's, right. that's exactly right. I didn't, it all started from an album that I didn't like. And I, that's when I was really despondent, uh -huh. you know, living on 7th Street between 1st and 2nd of Manhattan before everything became gentrified. You know, right. when it really was, you know, look, you had to, it was great because it was cheap. Right. You know, but um, but yeah, it just started from an album that I hated uh, and that I really felt despondent, especially when the label, you know, wouldn't, you know, give me a second album. Of course, you know, you're waiting to, to hear something and then you find out that it's not going to happen. And then you're sitting there wondering, OK, what am I going to do? So I started putting together some other bands, of course, uh, one of which Mark Swirsky was part of. Mm -hmm. And um, then I got the call from Dan Hartman, still on 7th Street. And uh, he said to me, hey, you know, I really like what you do. Do you want to have a cup of coffee and uh, let's talk? And so uh, we met, uh, I think, was on a, a coffee shop on in Manhattan up on 58th Street, or 57th, I forget, on the west side. And um, he said, so he wanted to try to do some writing. And I said, well, yeah, considering I'm broke, considering I got dropped from my label, you know, and uh, I've been sitting around wondering what I'm gonna do next, let's do it. You know, and things happened from there fairly quickly with Dan because his talent. And really I didn't need anybody pushing me at that point because everybody came to Dan. Right. Everybody came to Dan for something, you know, he, he produced Tina Turner, and of course, you're affiliated with his stuff. And then he got the call for James Brown, which, of course, you know, then Living in America, we wrote for that, which has become through the years, you know, uh, you know, a standard, you know, wow. actually, maybe the most famous James Brown song amongst younger people. Yeah, I was talking to my wife about that um, right before we, we called today, and I was listening to Living in America. And uh, my wife said, do you think that's James Brown's uh, most famous song? And I said, well, definitely to his later career it is. And it was yeah. actually the last thing that he did that was really substantial. Yeah, and, no, uh, it, it is. And, and it keeps getting played. And, um, Jim Farber recently wrote, a, this rock and roll writer recently wrote an article about the 15, you know, American patriotic yeah. songs you should listen to and of course yeah. living in america is on there yeah. and you know I'm, I'm proud of it because when it first came out you know of course uh there were i mean it was a huge hit because it was in three minutes of rocky four and you can't buy that type of promo right so um and at that time james brown wasn't having a lot of success uh, on, on radio even he, even though he was at the time still uh, had the most like top 40 songs of any uh, black artist in the history of radio. Um, you know, and, you know, it, it was amazing with living in America because at the time when it came out, the reviews were, uh, oh, it's not a real, it's not a real James Brown song. It's good. It's pop. It's a Dan Hartman thing, et cetera, et cetera. And of course we had a big hit. But the, the, the reviews, I mean, some were wonderful, but some were like, really, didn't let it compare to, you know, James Brown's early stuff, you know, um, uh, and, and, and they're right in a certain sense. But after that, okay, it is, I think it's become, and this is, believe me, his early, I mean, James Brown is one, I think, one of the top, maybe three most influential uh, 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 performers and artists in the history of our our. our uh, 60s 70s and so forth music yeah. but but it's really become i think you know and i'm really proud of it you know a song that you know uh people identify with james brown probably more than his other older songs sure. for a a, a, a gener a certain generation not only that you have a little known guitar player on there stevie ray vaughn stevie ray vaughn uh, 
And Uwe Vaughn, I, I don't know if people realize that he plays on, uh, he uses a big James Brown fan. And uh, he actually uh, asked if he could be on the, uh, the recording. And um, there wasn't much negotiation to do. Dan did, Dan being the producer, really didn't have to pay him much. He just came in and played until like four o'clock in the morning. And it was just like watching a Stevie Ray Vaughan concert. I mean, truly one of the greatest musicians I've ever, ever heard. Uh, watching him was like watching a performance. He comes in in, in in full regalia. He is Stevie Ray Vaughan. And really, the guitar is like an extension of his body. And and although we were hoping he would stop at some point, and we didn't we really want to say that's enough, Stevie. So we kept on watching for hours and hours. It's pretty cool. It was it was I, I can't even say it was an amazing. You, um, yeah, but the, and at the time he worked for you, he was also working with Bowie, right? He was doing um, the Let's Let's Dance session. Uh, yeah, he was. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. He was. He was. He's supposed to go on. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, but yeah, no, we did the Bowie. Yeah. He was, he, was, he was supposed to go on tour with David, and David offered him 300 a night to tour, and he said, no, nah, I don't work for that, and uh, Earl Slick took his spot, yeah. and Earl Slick took Stevie Ray's spot. Yeah, that, those... another, another, another great guitarist. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. It's like, I mean, what do you say? But the thing what's, what's interesting about Stevie's career is that he has become iconic without having that, like, multi-platinum, platinum, platinum selling uh, albums, and that's really difficult to do, but it was simply because he was so great in every yeah. sense, not only in in his guitar playing, but but also in in what he put himself forward as, um, you know. And and that, I thought that was really interesting to me because there's not many people who that it, it happens to, and it comes because you've created something and you become something very original and. And, and unique or truly, truly great. Yeah, his brother's brilliant too. Jimmy Vaughn is an incredible guitarist as well. Amazing. I have an interesting story. I was asked to go after Stevie passed away. I was asked to go to Atlanta to work with the remainder of the Double Trouble band. Okay. And uh, it was really an interesting. I wound up. We we did some rehearsing and things together. Uh, I didn't wind up, I don't even know if they came out with an album after that, but it wasn't, you know, they were, they were great musicians, but it no. was without Stevie, you know, look, it, yeah. it wasn't the same. And no. I wound up not actually, uh, you know, and it was, I think it was Phil Grande who was playing with them and who asked me to come down. Phil Grande was a guitarist yeah. that I use also, may he rest in peace, uh, the last guitarist in the Charlie Midnight Band, and one of the Charlie Midnight bands, and also a truly great, great guitarist. So, know? do you have a do you have a Charlie Midnight band ready when this record hits? You go out on the road a little bit? No, I'm just gonna I'm I'm just gonna do what everybody else does. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna put it on a track. I'm gonna press a button, and Mark and I are gonna go out and keep all the money. Yeah, that's the way to do it. <laughs> why, why, why pay a band or worry if the drummer is too loud or the guitarist has to turn down? No, um, you know we'll, we'll 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 see what happens. I would love to perform again. Yeah. But that was, we'll see, I don't want to project. I don't have expectations. I want to get the music out uh, because it's possible. And, um, you know, just enjoy it. And because it takes some of the enjoyment away when you have tons of expectations. Well, maybe this will catch on because of whatever reason. Um, I'm going to stick to my, take the middle ground, do it because it feels good and you're going to be able to enjoy it. That's the ground I'm going to take. And this way, um, you know, I will. I'll have a good time. Well, look what your first album. Look, look what the first album led to. It's going to be amazing right. to see what this one leads to. Right, this one could really lead to. I figure, you know, uh, took another when forty years, but maybe my superstardom is waiting for me. You never know. I mean, oh. so. Uh, but hey. listen, I'm, I'm, I'm. It's, it's coming out, uh, and, uh, and the book is coming out. So this is a. A really nice time for me. Well, you deserve it. You stay. Okay. But deserves got nothing to do with deserves it. Deserves got nothing to do with it. I, I earned know. it. I know. <laughs> you earned it. You deserve it. And um, 
you know, and, and a lot of crap involved. <laughs> oh, <laughs> let me tell you, and you and you take a lot of crap. And you take a lot of crap. Yeah, you do. You take a lot of crap along the way, and uh, you know, it's interesting because I say in the book, how do you turn C R A P into C R A P P? And, uh, you know, just a couple of clever things that I, whether they are clever or not, that I came up with. But it seems to be, seems to attract people to it because they want to know what that is. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that the next step is they actually read the book, you know, which I think they're going to enjoy. And I purposely kept it not too long because I know that, you know, uh, people don't read that much these days. Yeah. You know, so I thought if I could just make it fun and not too long and put just enough uh, anecdotes in there to to uh, to to talk about my journey and prove my point um i'm good i'm done and it is not a book about how to write songs although i do give a little bit at the end about okay. uh, my belief in songwriting well charlie i'd like you to um commit to one more hour with me not today um sure. after the book comes out i want to read it Okay. Um, I mean, I know I'm going to copy this week. I want to read the book, and I want to talk to you at the beginning of September, and we'll talk about the antidotes in the book. Let's do it. I'm ready. You know, Elliot, it's a total pleasure talking to you. Uh, you you too, know, I feel friend. like we have a real conversation. Yeah. And um, you know, of course, like I always like talking about myself, like you know, hey. like any ostensible artist, uh, any artist does. So uh, yeah, well, yeah. But anyway, anyway, it's a, a real pleasure. To you. Okay, so we'll 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 do it again. You know, I'll try to have a different background on for our Zoom. I'd you know, just that. a, li a, li you, a little you, variety. Yours is snappier than mine. I got to I got to look for some cool ones. I'm telling you, <laughs> you look, I, I I like the apocalyptic ones a lot. You know, yeah, like I'm yeah. sitting in a in a in a, in a, in a post-apocalyptic. Uh, you look like the you look like the king of the underworld today. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, the king of something would be nice. You know, but. Uh, the king of my, although not real, my wife is the ruler of the house. But uh, mine you know, too. I'm, mine I'm, too. I'm, 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 I'm her subject regardless. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I told you, my my family was German, uh, Russian. She comes from a, a Hungarian background. You don't mess with the Hungarians. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's true. Hey, listen, my wife is a Viking. Yeah. To finish, so you don't mess yeah. with them either. But anyway, yeah. it's a real pleasure, Elliot. You know, I at any time you just let me know, and we okay. will. Do it, and I really appreciate this and the chance to talk about my book and the and the the music I'm making. Oh, uh, much, before, much, yeah. Am I allowed to play the single now, or is it too early? Sure. Yeah. No. Well, uh, I I don't know. It's being released on the. Th maybe we should. I, I don't know. I'd have. To, I don't want to. I have so many people that are working hard for me. Get back. Get back to me on that. That I don't want to. Uh, if they think, well, you shouldn't have done it, although I don't know what the... Get, yeah. get, back, get back to me. Okay, all right, okay. we'll do it. And we can definitely do it like when, when we, we can definitely do it in our next okay. co conversation. But uh, I just uh, I just want to respect how hard they're working. And, you know, they know the landscape about the way, you got to do this thing, you got to do that thing. And I'm, you know, I, I'm somebody usually poo-poos that, but I really do want to respect how hard they work. Oh, you should. Okay, so you just let me know. And um, Charlie, it's been a pleasure again, and I'll speak to you next Total month. Total pleasure. Sounds okay, good to me, brother. Okay, great. Okay, Have my a friend. Great day. Stay okay, well. Bye. 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 Not Your Mother's Radio is listener funded. If you wish to contribute, our PayPal info is notyourmothersradio at gmail.com. That's notyourmothersradio at gmail.com.